You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. From aliens to ghosts, demons to angels, and from shadow people to the outlandish, Heidi Hollis the Outland, Outland, Outland. Welcome, welcome everybody to my awesome Friday evening. You're listening to me, Heidi Hollis, the Outlander, as I am multitasking here. I'm trying to put a post on Facebook right now. Tell everybody, come join me now. Okay, all right, hold on. Did I get it? All right. Yep, posted. Okay, so, <laughs> yes, yeah, so welcome to the show, everybody. You're probably just like scratching your head like there's a chick on here and she's like doing something and I don't know exactly what she's doing. But it's okay. This is all normal. This is this is how I roll. Um, so I guess I should tell you guys what this program is about. This show is about bringing outlandish topics to the forefront. I don't care what it is. Angels, ghosts, demons, holy encounters, shadow people, Bigfoot. To the outlandish. I always say, if it's weird, we're here. And so are you. So you're among friends. It's all good. I'm still multitasking, so don't mind me. Gosh, there's like fruit flies around here. What the heck's going on? There's no fruit out. <laughs> it just seems to be like those seasons where fruit flies will suddenly just be born and just like all of a sudden disappear. I, I don't understand where they're coming from. Um, so, yeah. So to tell you just a little bit more about myself, when it comes to the outlandish, I feel and I think I'm someone who has been there, seen that, experienced it, freaked out, found some answers, wrote about it, got over it. And now I'm hoping to help others do the same thing and understand this world of various levels, vibrations, dimensions. I don't know. I don't know. People say that there's different dimensions. I think I've seen some. So there. Um, if you dare, go to my main website, which is HeidiHollis.com. And I also want to invite you to check out TheOtherFWord.com. Mm-hmm. Go there, and uh, I am doing something. I am trying to pull together some forces to bring forth a book and project on the other F word. What is the other F word? Um, hmm, how do you combat darkness but with a little light? So uh, faith, you know, whatever it is that you're passionate about when it comes to the positive side. I mean, if you see something in the likes of the devil looking at you, you better hope that there's a lighter side. You know what I'm saying? So um, that is what I'm rooting for in trying to put together this other project. Because for some reason, these publishers think, I, because I'm not a pastor or a priest, I shouldn't be talking about faith. Like, I have no place talking about faith. Well, I'm going to talk about faith because I can. And so can you. So let's all do it. I mean, what a thought. Um, so I encourage you and invite you, please go there, theotherfword.com, trying to raise funds to get this project forward for another book on the topic. I have one for kids. Mostly adults have been responding back, which is cool. So that means, hey, it's for everybody. Okay. So uh, you can go to theotherfword.com and you will find information on that book, which is already out as well, because I felt it was important to do that. I'm still multitasking uh, to do that as well. Goodness. There's been a lot of people joining my groups on Facebook, which is cool. Everybody go to paranormalpledge.com, by the way, and uh, click on over there and join my group to get people to pledge to start speaking about the paranormal and sharing with at least one other person their paranormal experiences. And also, if you go on Facebook and you type in shadow people and hat man experiencers group yes it's a big old word it's not the first shadow people group that pops up because i know there's somebody out there kind of how do you say was that a poser or something that somebody's like uh, grabs everybody that's looking for you yeah i don't know what that's called um but yes i get that um but yeah no that one's not mine but mine is shadow people and hat man experiencers group got it okay yeah that's that's me so um 
I am going to do what I love to do the most. I want to invite you guys first, get the IRN app, and also feel free to call into the show because I welcome everybody to call into the show. You know, I just did Coast to Coast last Friday. Yeah, last Friday. And I was seeking those who have experienced such things as night terrors. What is night terrors? Sleep paralysis, sleepwalking, nightmares, um, feeling somebody is watching you or experiencing somebody is watching you or something when you wake up. So all those things are considered night terrors. And uh, holy cannoli, have I been flooded with that. I mean, I cover a lot of different things. So Shadow People, Hatman, Jesus Encounters, Angels, anything and everything out of the ordinary. So I invite people to still continue to write to me about those topics as well. But as far as night terrors are concerned, I am trying to pull together a new TV show project. I'm, I'm helping out with a new TV show project, a potential one, uh, trying to bring some light and attention to the topic of night terrors, what could be behind it. And no, it does not mean that a person has mental illness if you experience night terrors. How what a thought How about that. But there are those who will think it's something scientific or emotional and all that stuff. And I am, of course, on the side of the paranormal. So I think that uh, we're pretty spiritual beings. And uh, I think there's energies out there that can mess with that. And, of course, get you when your guard is down. That's always the best time, right? That's when predators lurk the, <laughs> the most. Um, so I welcome you. Write me to dusoutlander at gmail.com. D-A-S outlander at gmail.com. And uh, I will do my best to, I always get to the emails eventually. So feel free to write me. And uh, if you wish, I will forward your email and information on to those doing the TV show project. And uh, nothing can be shown or aired without your exclusive written permission. So don't feel because you're probably talking to somebody that will contact you in regards to your night terrors that, oh my gosh, I've been exposed. Don't feel that way. So, okay. Getting to my favorite, 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 favorite thing. Uh, 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 uh. The outlandish corner. I have no special effects. <laughs> so I'm going to go over to the outlandish corner and I'm having some trouble with my word here, Microsoft word. I don't know what the dealio is, but Let's hope it does not crash in the middle of my reading these emails off. Oh, let me do this here. Do, 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 do. Okay. All right. I've just got to pull this up. You know, I'm just so prepared this evening. <laughs> okay. Dear Heidi, hello. I just discovered your website. Well, all right. I'd like to share a story with you. I usually do not write to strangers like this. <laughs> I am a stranger. Oh, boy. Um, my daughter had an experience with a hat man. But since she had just returned from Amish country, Pennsylvania, and brought home a handmade doll. Okay, that gives me the creeps already. We assumed it was that. So you assumed the hat man was the homemade doll. Okay. I've always been firm when it comes to any entity visiting my space. In my experience, they are usually curious and or protecting their own. In this instance, it didn't leave until I put the Amish doll outside and said my protective prayers. For my daughter's benefit, I use salt and a smudge stick. Pretty sure it was with the doll. To this day, she doesn't like it, but it left and hasn't returned. P.S. My protective prayers involve the wolf spirit and God's light. The wolf spirit, because of the joy we had with one of them joining our family, and my lifelong sense that I am part of the wolf world. God's light is all white and blinding. My faith in that light has been developing for many, many years. Carolyn in Alaska. Well, hello, Carolyn in Alaska. Hello. How's it going? Um, wow. I can say that I've never heard of a wolf spirit or something to stand behind. I, I that's different. That's that's news to me. Let's just put it that way. God's light. Oh yeah, I've heard about that. That's uh, that's that's pretty well known. Um, I don't know if this is a native belief. If you're a native up there in Alaska, don't know, but it sounds kind of nativeish to me. Um, if it's positive, well, okay. Um, it, you know, I'm curious about this handmade doll. 
from Amish country. Aren't those people kind of religious? Why? I don't know. Why would Hatman attach himself to a doll from probably the most anally, I mean, the most religious people on the planet? I I was going to say anally religious, but you know what I'm saying. Very strict religious people. Okay, um, to the point of wow, they really, they really isolate themselves. Interesting people, very interesting. That's that's all I'll say. Um, so wow, why would the hat man be attached to that doll? Did they drag it behind one of their buggies and he caught on? I don't know. That's different. I mean, yes, things like the hat man could be attached to objects. I've experienced such a thing where. Something negative was attached. I, I believe I've shared this before, but I like sharing these these stories. So let, let's see if I could conjure up my memories on this crazy story. So, like, um, one of my friends had this old perfume bottle, and it was really fancy. It was like black and had a little little like feather attached to it. It was just it was old and fancy. You could just tell like it had been around. And uh, so my friend gave it to me. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to keep that here. Okay, so this is awesome. So I, you know, had I had, a, I had a college roommate at the time. And I put this perfume bottle up in the cabinet. That night, I could not sleep for the life of me. Like, I felt <sighs> my spirit was disturbed, if that's a way of putting it. Like, like you close your eyes and and it's almost like uh, a thousand voices going on at the same time. <laughs> it's like noise, noise, and you knew it was negative. And I was like, huh? You know, I'd wake up, and be like, what was that? Go back to sleep. Huh? What was that? I'm like, gosh, this is crazy. You know, I was in college. I had stuff to do the next day. I'm like, I can't sleep. I got up to go sit at the kitchen table because I was like, I mean, that was so not like me to get up like that. And lo and behold, my college roommate was sitting at the table. I'm like, whoa, what are you doing up? And she was like, oh, I can't sleep. I keep hearing like lots of like chatter or something, like something disturbing her rest. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, that is so weird. I wonder what it could be. And whoo, my attention went like, like my eyes were drawn to look at the cabinet where this perfume bottle was. And I'm like. Could it be? Could it be? And I'm like, you know, I was given this perfume bottle and uh, it's just kind of weird. It had a little musky smell to it of some old lady perfume in there. And and my friend's like, it must be that. I mean, where'd it come from? Like, well, you know, I don't know, but my friend gave it to me. It's like, oh, okay. So the next day, I call up the friend that gave me the perfume bottle and I'm like, so I wanted to give you this back <laughs> because I don't know. I just, I just don't, I, I'm probably never use it. I mean, who's going to pour perfume into this thing? I mean, I wasn't going to do it. And she said, Oh no, no, I don't want it because it had a bad vibe on it. <laughs> so she gave it to me. I was like, what? Isn't that something? I'm like, well, thanks a lot. She would not take it. I threw that thing out. And you know what? I slept fine ever since. <laughs> so it was, there you go. So there you go. There goes your attachment story to odd things. So that that can happen. I don't think that necessarily happened because it came from Amish country. But who's 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 to know? I could tell you this. I never liked dolls. Never liked. I like stuffed animals. I never liked dolls. Their their eyes, them trying to look human and all. It just was a it was a it was a farce, and I knew it. They weren't real. <laughs> so that wasn't about it. And I have six sisters, okay? And uh, I was one of the youngest. And I just felt like dolls had to be, they just had to be destroyed. Like, they had to be hidden, their heads ripped off and separated. Kind of like when you want to get rid of a Ouija board, you take the blanchet off and you, you separate it. And that's what I felt dolls' heads had to have happen. They must have thought I was disturbed. I just did not like them looking at me. So I figured they needed to be dismantled. And, uh hidden after you did that so that's what i did if i could they were a lot older than me so they didn't appreciate my my tactics to try to save their souls from these dolls so okay um <laughs> uh carolyn interesting stuff uh, i'll have to look up a wolf spirit I, I i know i've heard it in native something as far as you know believing in somebody fighting for you type of thing so that's that's interesting 
Interesting. I just go with God. God works great. Um, okay, going to the next one. It says, Dear Heidi, I heard you on Coast to Coast. And I have had a very unusual experience. I had to be hospitalized January 13th of this year. Unbeknownst to me, I had pneumonia. When I got there, I had a heart attack. I had to be put on life support. I had this weird experience of someone in the doorway on the left, which there was no doorway. Hmm? Where th- which there was no doorway or man with a black fedora hat and black suit. Okay, something's, something's not been... Okay, they didn't put some word in there. I don't know what's missing. Um, was no doorway or man with a black fedora and a black suit standing there. It was very light in the back of him. Bright white light. He was standing near, staring at me with his arms crossed down across his body. I thought it was a visitor from one of my family members, maybe one of their friends. I asked my husband if one of his work fellows came to see me, and he said no. It has really bothered me that I had this experience. It was not a good feeling at all. When I heard your show on Coast to Coast, I said, oh my gosh, I wonder if it was that man that I saw. He never came back again. I do pray a lot, although I don't go to church. I'm a very spiritual person, and I have God in my life and lots of angels surrounding me. But maybe you could tell me why he was there. Thank you so much, Linda. Oh, Linda, I don't know. I don't know why they show up. Um, you know, when that happens to people, they always are like, you know, why was he there? Why was he looking at me? What is the problem? What's wrong with me and my faith? I have God in my life. I don't understand why he's looking at me. Well, you know, why does he look at anybody? Why does he look at a five-year-old? You know, does that five-year-old do something that I should know about? I mean, honestly, I mean, I don't know what triggers him to be the jolly, rotten stink that he is. <laughs> I like that. That sounded good. I should put that in a book. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Why would he look at you that way? Um what is disturbing to me is you had essentially a near death experience almost of a sort and he was the one waiting for you. So when that happens to a person, I have a little bit more mm, uh it's like a grinding of the teeth as he was gnashing his for you. I mean, it's not it's not a good thing. I mean, my gut feeling tells me he saw something in you that he liked and he seemed to be eyeballing like lipping his licking his chops like come to papa Ugh, i'm sorry i don't know why i don't know why he's there but you know i think we all like how can i say if you eat ribs okay everybody out there eat ribs no there's some vegetarians raising their hands saying no i eat carrots so okay sorry but cover your ears carrot eaters i eat ribs and when you eat ribs, you know, you know that there's going to be a drop somewhere and it's going to stain your clothes. It's going to stain your clothes and you're going to be like, oh, darn. And you know that drop is there. That stain is there because you were licking your chops, eating those ribs and just enjoying the heck out of those ribs. And you go about your day because you can't get nowhere to get it clean, you know, to get that stain out. I mean, it's a big barbecue sauce and rib juice stain. It's going to show the world I just had ribs until I could get this washed off. Now, you know that stain is there. When it comes to this dark thing looking your way, you know what he's looking at. Deep, deep down, you know you had some negative ribs, and it dripped on your soul somewhere, and you didn't wash the stain off. You don't know where exactly it is. Maybe it's in the back or on the side. I don't know. Maybe it's on your shoe, but it's there. You know it's there. So take the time to clean the spot off, you know, before you go out in public, before he gets a whiff of your barbecue juice drippings, (laughs) and uh and starts licking his chops for some of it because we all got little stains here and there. We just got to take the time to wipe it off. You know, parables uh, taught by the greatest parable teacher of all time. Hello, Jesus. So there you go. I don't know where the rib thing came from. I really kind of have a taste for some. So there you go. So I, I hope that 
that helped you a little bit, Linda. But we all got a little little stain somewhere. We got we got to wash off, and some stains are bigger than others. And uh, you know, nobody's perfect. I mean, it doesn't mean you should go down in flames, literally. So let's try to let's try to fix that, shall we? Okay. All right. Let me get to the next one here. I want to get at least three in because they're just fun. I got so many. Oh my gosh, I have so many, and it's always this dark man. Let's see what this one is. Okay, it says, Dear Heidi, my name is Martin. Hey, Martin. I heard your chat with George on Coast to Coast. It was great. Oh, thanks, Martin. My night terror started when I was 12 years old. My aunt played the Ouija board. Mm. And my younger sister and I grabbed it one afternoon and had communicated with a spirit named Lucas. Ah, Martin, if it wasn't George Lucas. Okay. It was giving us very accurate, correct answers until it asked me to leave and play alone with my little sister. We got freaked out and left. That same night, and we were in bed. My mom, sister, and I, the clo- and the closet door began to rattle and shake very loud. Okay, something's missing here. Very loud, and there was a very scary negative feeling to it. I would say any closet door shaking is going to give me a negative feeling. Okay. Um, and I recall my mother whispering to me, and grasping me, saying, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. I get a kick out of spooky stuff. Okay, so my little sister was asleep. Every night was a different experience since then. I've had hundreds of episodes. Oh, no. But the few I recall the most was being woken up in the middle of the night by the sound of loud old telephones. I had no phone in my room. And when I opened my eyes, there was a figure blacker than the pitch black. And its reaction was surprisingly, when I said hello, it jumped back and ran through the wall. I was always paralyzed through all of these episodes. The only thing I could control was my eyes. My eyes were always wide open. Oh, don't you hate that? Um, another episode I remember was waking up in a straight up position with this thing wrapping itself around my upper body like a snake. Ooh, I got chills, everybody. And grrring in my ear. Oh my gosh. Ugh, okay, I'm so freaked out. Okay, and grrring in my ear, then slowly loosening up and floated out my door. Years had passed. I would control it by trying to stay up all night i slept in school for years oh that's sad my parents had divorced at the time i had my last episode a little before my last episode i had taken a trip to the vatican Hmm, very cool and in the basement of the vatican (laughs) yes i've seen these in the basement of the vatican they have a mummified pope In a glass coffin. Not just one, let me tell you. I've seen several mummified popes. This is something a lot of people don't realize, but the popes get mummified. It's really... I'm not Catholic. I was stunned. Okay. Um, (laughs) I said... (laughs) Vatican, they had mummified in Pope and glass. Okay, I said to my father as a joke, let's take a picture. My dad said, no. So my last episode, I woke up and the mummified pope was floating over top of me and going, mm. oh, that's terrible, and trying to push my soul out of me. I turned my head, and in the corner of the room was a shadow man, and he walked right up to me. All my lights were on, by the way, and this figure crouched down and said, you know who I am. I'm Lucas. Oh, boy, I'd just pass out. This had been 10 years later now. I shook out of it and ran out of the room and called my mother, who at the time had found God through Christianity. And she asked me to go to my room and recite a prayer out loud over the phone. And poof, after 10 years, it was over. From one day to the next, I was comfortable to walk through the house at night Sleeping with the lights off again. I guess I'm just cocky now because I've got a weapon to fight these demons with the power of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Thank you for reading. Goodbye. Wow, that's um, that's powerful. That's that's really interesting. But uh, my gosh, how many chills can a 
email give me? Oh, that was Martin. Martin, that is something else. I mean, I, I, I wasn't catching the fast forward from when you were a kid, 10 years of that constant, hundreds of episodes, hundreds. That is just, my, that's mind blowing. You know, I've heard so many times where people have been bombarded, literally bombarded because of one dilly dallying with the Ouija board and, uh, they just regret it for the rest of their lives or for many years. And I'm wondering what the heck does it have to do with a with a Pope body, mummified Pope, floating over the top of you going, hmm, I mean, wow. It was trying to push your soul out of you. That's just disturbing. So the Pope, just to get this clear, the Pope was negative as well as this so-called Lucas dude. It wasn't Lucas. It was a, something like the hat man. Black figure crouched down. You know who I am. I'm Lucas. Well, he, he lies. Okay. He just likes to lie. That's just what he does. If he had a tongue, it would lie too. It's just, it's just what it is. Um, so, you know, I love that you shared your story because a lot of people feel helpless. They're like totally feel like at the mercy of these negative things. Like, oh my gosh, it's so big and bad. And he could wrap his body around me like a snake and growl. And, you know, it's terrifying. It is terrifying. I know what it is to feel like, gosh, there's no hope. What am I to do? I am helpless. But isn't it something like I, I understand that cockiness just a bit. I don't want to feel like, oh, no, I'm just so great. But. I know what you mean. It's it's not a cockiness. It's a confidence. It's a it's the confidence that gets instilled in a person when you have zero doubts in your faith and in that faith that can transform into light to repel this evil. That's not cocky. That's all good. Keep rolling. Keep rocking it, Martin. Honestly, because that's that's what it's all about. It's not so much uh, uh, a worry. Isn't that something? It's not a worry. Like, uh, I don't know if you heard when I was doing a Coast to Coast uh, show and George Norrie's like, Heidi, you know, how come this dark things haven't taken you out type of thing? And I was like, uh, because I have no doubts in my faith. And, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty settled and content with my faith and the amount that I can use to repel these things. And Thank God uh, Jesus is never far behind, and thank God that that name of Jesus burns the ears of these evil things. I don't care what it is, evil alien or whatever. And, and you know, I'm not a Bible thumper either. I am not. I don't go to church. It's not a bad thing, but I just, you know, I move a lot. I, I'm not, I, I feel fine wherever I'm at. I feel church happens where you're at. I think God happens where you're at. I think that your faith can live on no matter where you're at. And I think it's okay. I, I've had Jesus encounters. My book, Jesus is No Joke, says all about it. And um, I, he never told me, Heidi, you better get to church. So uh, nah, I think I'm okay. So you guys, I want to thank you guys for writing into me. And uh, we got to get to our next break so we can get in our, well, our first break, so we can get in our awesome guests. Oh, you guys are in for a treat. You're listening to me, Heidi Haas, The Outlander, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to me, Heidi Hollis, The Outlander. Welcome to the show. Put your feet up. You're welcome to call into the show at 1-888-919-2355. And as always, I realize most of you listen to the app. So I know a lot of people are like, oh, darn, it's not live. I can't call in no more. So I totally understand. It's all good. But you guys are in for a super duper treat tonight because this is just... This is something that I have never, ever, ever spoken about on the show, and it's just a topic that I think you guys will really dig and enjoy. So, my guest this evening is Michael Pfeiffer, and uh, we are going to talk about uh, be talking about Twilight Zone, Rod Serling. Oh yes, we have the creator of the Rod Serling Archives. O M G, Michael! Round of applause for Michael Pfeiffer. How the heck are you this evening, Michael? I'm fine, and I thank you for the opportunity to talk about Rod Serling. Oh, my goodness. I have to make some confessions. Okay, so Rod Serling is like the Bugs Bunny of paranormal horror sci-fi mystery for me because Bugs Bunny is my favorite cartoon character. And Rod Serling is just, he's so dang interesting. I mean, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm just... 
I'm just speechless because he's he's so unique and such a such a unique guy that I've never had the opportunity to discuss with anybody. So, but first, I want people to know your background a little bit and what you've been doing and how did you get to be in the position that you are. Okay, around 1970 when I graduated, I went to Broome Community Technical College in Binghamton, New York, and shortly after I started there. Up walks Rod Serling one day. I'm sitting on the library steps, and the doors weren't open yet, and he stood there and talked with me for 20 minutes. What? That was a unique experience. And, uh, oh. you know, and he was only five foot five, some say five foot four and a half, and <laughs> he did something I didn't pay attention to at the time. I was sitting on the bottom step, and he walked up three steps and stood so that we were eye to eye. And oh. I never thought about it until later as I realized how short he was. <laughs> because he didn't appear that short on the Twilight Zone intros, because right. they shoot the short people from the feet up to make them appear taller. Uh, so at any rate, I also met Rod again the same year, 1971, for a few minutes when he was speaking to the campus. And about that time, I decided to buy a 16 millimeter sound projector. I had been collecting silent films as a kid from eight years old up, and I bought a projector and some films, and decided to start trying to buy some Twilight Zone films. And uh, so I started attending film conventions all over the country, and I decided to specialize in vintage television instead of just feature films. And you have to realize at that time period, there was no video that came out in 78, the first VHS machines, and there was no Internet as we have the convenience of today to Google search or whatever. <laughs> so it was very difficult, but I started buying TV packages in bulk, and I soon accumulated a lot of Rod Serling films, not just Twilight Zones, but some of those live kinescopes from the Golden Age from 1950 to 1960, uh, when he wrote a lot of live television. And then I stumbled on a rare series called The Loner that followed the Twilight Zone series. And that was a Civil War Western series starring Lloyd Bridges. And it only ran for 26 weeks. So I'm just going to give you a tidbit to this now, and then as you ask questions, we can get into the meat and potatoes. Of some Sounds of good. Hey, let's programs. do it. So, you know, I started buying posters as well uh, from all of his features. He wrote 12 or 13 screenplays including Planet of the Apes, which so many people today don't realize he was a first writer on the original Planet of the Apes for Charlton Heston. Nice. So that gives a background as to how I got into collecting. I'm now 63, and I'm still going strong, uh, still collecting. And a little bit more background. In 1968 in Binghamton, the New York State Historical Marker uh, took Binghamton High School, where Rod graduated, and placed a historic marker in front of the high school. So I went to that ceremony, and that's where I met his teacher, Helen Foley, who he wrote a Twilight Zone about Nightmare as a Child. And she said, we've just formed a committee called the Rod Serling Memorial Foundation. And within six months, I was the first president. I was elected. And uh, I worked with them for seven years. And they're still going strong in Binghamton, although they have a different focus. Uh, on what they do. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so, you know, working with Helen and a lot of people that went to school with Rod, uh, some of his war buddies that served with Rod, I was privileged to interview a lot of them in the late 80s through 1994. So since then, I've still been attending conventions around the country, but now we've been lucky in picking up props. Uh, no big props, because they're really tough to find, but we have some unique ones. Uh, handwritten letters, canceled checks, uh, which Carol Serling has probably sold thousands of his widow, and uh, but they still bring a big buck, three to five hundred dollars for a canceled check. It's wow. pretty good money. I wish mine Goodness. were worth that. <laughs> yeah, right. So, the Bundy Museum reached out to me. They opened ten years ago in Binghamton, and uh, the owner reached out to me based on my experience with the foundation and wanted me to come in. And he did three interviews, and he says, I want to build a big archive collection. I want to build an archive website, which we've done. And uh, April 15th of this year, we dedicated a whole room of permanent exhibit for Rod Serling, which we are changing this October. We're going to revamp it about every six months so that we can put new material in. And because of that opening, the newspaper article here, the Binghamton Press, did such a big article that it was picked up by the AP Wire Service for almost every newspaper in the country. Because of that, the Bundy Museum is now famous, and so is the archive. 
we have people, we just had three from California, San Diego last week. They're coming in from all over, a professor of music from Juilliard. They are just coming in droves to see the Rod Serling exhibit, so we're very pleased. My goodness. You know, he's, I mean, okay, at first I have to ask, I mean, when it came to all of the stories, I mean, I'm, I'm a Twilight Zone junkie. I could watch them over and over and over again. Did he have a hand in writing everything that we saw in that series? Rod Serling wrote 92 strips out of 156. Oh, wow. So that was five seasons. It was actually canceled after season three, the half-hour shows. Hmm. And so he went back to Antioch College to teach. And while he was out there after a couple of months, CBS picked it up again for an hour format. But he was committed to still teaching, so he was going back and forth. So of the 16 one-hours, I think he only wrote three. Uh, he just wasn't able to because of his teaching obligations. And most of the hour ones for the fans that have seen them, they were never syndicated, but now with the box sets of DVDs that are out there, they're they're all available. Did he oversee everything that was written, though? Did he, like, make sure uh, it was he true? His, he had his hand in most everything. Uh, okay. Yeah, he owned 50% of the company, Cayuga Productions. Their home was on Cayuga Lake outside of Ithaca, New York. And uh, so it was Cayuga Productions, and he owned 50% of the company. He did a lot of the writing. I mean, he did a lot of the uh, producing. He did a lot of picking the cast he wanted. As a matter of fact, many episodes he wrote specifically for certain individuals that he had liked their work he'd seen in other things, or they worked in live television with him in the 50s. So he did a lot of casting himself as well. Um, Mm. So he yeah, made sure that things stay true and blue to the Twilight Zone theme. So yes, the, the exactly. thing that, the, that I want to, I really want to uh, understand, I mean, it's just the depths to which his mind looked at reality. I mean, for his, for that time, for that era, is it's just like, even still today, I mean, I, I love, even, even that it's black and white, I love that element because it kind of adds to the, mystery of it all like what did it really look like you know I, I just I love that and it's like to think that uh you know it's all relative still it's like the, the way that he he conceptualized his storylines it's like oh I've thought about that and oh I wonder if that was ever a possibility and you know he went there and he portrayed it on screen on top of it to make it just really hit home with people I mean how do you how do you account for you know the way that his mind worked <laughs> well, you know, I, some people have said he, he was a writing genius like Mark Twain. I don't agree to that degree, but for the television writing, nobody has ever surpassed Rod Serling or will. He won six Emmys for dramatic television writing, which is held up to this day. And it can never be beat because if you look back then, there was 39 episodes per season. He wrote most all of them himself. Today you might have 12 episodes per season with right. 12 different writers. Right. So nobody is ever going to, to win six Emmys for dramatic writing. Like <laughs> he did. And what's interesting is the reason he branched out into the science fiction and fantasy realm was because of his censorship. He's known as the last angry man of television because he fought vehemently against the censors um, all through the 50s. As a matter of fact, he even went to Washington and protested to Congress and everything about the uh, FCC and the censorship. And Back then, from 1950, when he first wrote for television, through 60, considered the golden age of TV, it was live television. So there was never a plan for residuals or reruns. Uh, until about 55, they started filming on 16 millimeter and syndicating some. But when you're talking live television, <laughs> you know, mistakes and all, it airs. It is what it is. And uh, it was fascinating. But, for example, he was, he was doing the Playhouse 90 uh, on the Emmett Till case about the young black gentleman that was murdered down south. I think he was 16. And right. they just made him rewrite it. They made him take Coca-Cola off the shelf because they said that symbolizes racism. Coca-Cola does. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, how far, that's how far they went. And he did another one on uh, Nazis and the Holocaust in the, uh, the, the prison camps. And the sponsor was a gas company. So they were not allowed to mention the gas chambers, which was the whole point of the whole <laughs> dramatic theme of the episode. So he really fought against censorship. Oh. And there's a famous half-hour television show, I think it's on the DVD box set, of Twilight Zone with Mike Wallace, an interview. 
And in there, Mike Wallace says, well, I hear you're giving up writing serious television. And boy, that flipped him off. And he says, no, I'm not giving up anything. But he said, as a writer, and with censorship, I am not allowed to say what some Republican character might say or a Democratic character might say. But if I make that another planet, another time, with an alien saying the same dialogue, mm. that's okay. So that's how he decided to do this, the Twilight Zone series and branch out where he could say and get his point across by putting it out in that outer space or into fantasy. Oh, really? And and that's how we're able to relate to it still today because he was borrowing from reality and had a lot to say, and so he distorted yeah. it. Interesting. Yeah, in the twist endings. I mean, that's what he's most famous for. Yes. So even the other writers, like Richard Matheson, one of the greatest writers, uh, and Ray Bradbury, and George Slayton Johnson, the other writers of Twilight Zone, all tried to keep that twist ending going just like he did. Some of them succeeded, some did not. But every one of his certainly has a twist ending. And it's like a good book. You can read it ten times. Well, you can watch a Twilight Zone episode ten times or more. Oh, and yeah. every time you're going to see something different. You're going right. to pick up something in the background or, oh, I didn't catch that phrase the first time. So that's why yourself and I and all the fans of Twilight Zone in particular can watch these over and over. And even though you might know every line of dialogue or you hear one line and you know what the episode is. You know, it's just so popular. When I talk to people, I can mention one or two words and they tell me the episode, who stars in it. I mean, it's just amazing, the, the fan base for Twilight Zone in particular. Yeah, and you know, I'm sorry, but I have yet to uh, watch an episode and go, well, that stunk. I mean, I've never come, you know, and I'm you talking know, about the there older were, There were some. As a matter of fact, Rod Sterling himself said about 20% of the episodes were lousy. Oh, see, I... Including some that he wrote. But here's his, his philosophy that. behind that. They were such a low budget at MGM where they were filming for you to to do a great alien sequence on a planet or a great Western sequence or whatever the theme was, they had to do them on a small soundstage with little toy props. <laughs> and so some episodes, in particular, The Invaders with Agnes Moorhead, where mm -hmm. she doesn't speak at all, she's mute, she's... You know, a tall person, you see the United States soldiers or, uh, uh, pretending to be the alien. She thinks they're aliens invading her, and mm -hmm. it actually is. She's the alien, and they're there checking out the planet. Well, she doesn't talk in that whole episode. And Rod said in an interview that is his favorite episode that he did not write. Really? And what's interesting about it is Agnes Moorhead, of course, and or on Bewitched, so most people know her for yes. that. She was a great yes. actress. Yeah. And she had no dialogue in the whole episode. So she studied with Marcel Marceau, the world famous mind, for a month to learn how to not talk and deliver the performance she wanted to do. That's how dedicated really? she was. Really? What was that episode called? The Invaders. The Invaders. Okay, got you. And if you look at it on a bigger screen than a small 19 inch or a 10 inch like back then, you mm -hmm. will see. The, the invaders, supposedly the two U.S. astronauts, were little toy cardboard cutouts. Mm. You can see strings and you can see. And that's what Rod was referring to. There was no budget to really do justice to some of those episodes. But, yeah, he, he said several times that was his favorite of the episodes he did not write. Goodness. Well, uh, I've got a question in the chat room. Uh, Time Walker is asking, do you know what episodes that Rod patterned after actual events that he experienced in his life? Well, I can think of one that's quite famous, and that is Mirror Image, about the bus station with Vera Miles and Martin Milner, where they have their uh, counterparts on another planet. Are They see them here at the bus station, and uh, they're taking over the original body. And that's an interesting episode, because Rod was telling in one of the interviews where he was at the London airport, and he looked across the room waiting to get into the airplane, and he saw somebody that had the same coat he had on, the same hat he had on, and when the, he turned around, he said, it was my identical twin. <laughs> and it really freaked him out. And I think that's what prompted him from what I've read in interviews and listened to some speeches, uh, that that prompted him to do that episode. And wow. that's important to us in Binghamton because the episode deals with our Binghamton bus station. CBS, when that aired for a publicity photo, showed Rod getting on a bus in front of our actual bus station. So in that episode, 
although we've tried to narrow it down that it was probably Ithaca College where they were en route to. The main character says, I'm from Binghamton twice. He mentions Portland five times, Syracuse three times, and a small town Tully that was on the bus route. So he was famous to you know, keep Binghamton and all of his hometown friends and relations alive in a lot of his episodes. Oh, that is so cool. I mean, I guess when you you have such a creative mind and, you know, you know how to write it well, I mean, you could do anything that you want. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. I guess if you remember the pilot, uh, Where Is Everybody, the half-hour pilot, um, Earl Holloman, there's a scene where Earl Holloman gets trapped in a phone booth. He's trying to dial somebody, and, of course, there's no people there in the whole episode, just him talking. And he couldn't get out, and that happened to Rod as well. Mm. So back in 86, I was uh, I did a film festival with the foundation, and I had done some business with Earl Holland, and I called him, and I said, would you like to come and be our guest at this festival? And he says, Mike, he says, I'm in Calgary shooting a... Another Gunsmoke Western out of the 12 rerun movies they did. But he says, I'll make a cassette tape for you. And so he mailed me a cassette tape of about 12 minutes where he told me his personal story of how Rod cornered him in the parking lot. They'd never met. He said, actually, Rod dove right on me and knocked me on the front of my car. <laughs> and he said, I want you to star in this new pilot, sci-fi pilot, I'm doing Twilight Zone. And he hired him. Uh, Earl agreed on the spot. And that was interesting, but something weird happened on that episode. Uh, Earl Holloman told on the tape that they had done one whole day of shooting and there was no film in the camera. And he had done <laughs> such, a, such a cold and a raspy voice that they had to reshoot everything. And so if you listen carefully, you will hear the different takes from the cold and the raspy in his throat to the clear dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, we're really great privileged to have that cassette tape as part of our archive because things that I collected are all there now as well as, uh, you know, the things we buy every week for the for the archive and exhibit. And we've, you know, wow. transcribed it. So we have... What, you know, what a moment, though. Who smacked themselves on the forehead and said, no, ah, yeah. no film! I, I've been trapped in those phone booths and could not get out two or three times. <sighs> And I had panic attacks, and I freaked out, too. So wow. I can see very well where he had in Earl Holland put that element in. <laughs> he also used another Binghamton store called Resnick's Mannequins, Women's Apparel. And uh, one of the first scenes in the thing, Rod thinks he sees a woman in a panel truck. He goes over, or he opens the door, and a, a lady mannequin falls out. And he's talking to the mannequin and laughing, and then it pans up and it says Resnick's Department Store, which was our Binghamton store. And then you can even see in the background into the warehouse with all these women mannequins. So I don't know if he had a fetish for mannequins, but he used them in a lot of episodes, right. including one of the most famous, the After Hours, with uh, Anne Francis is a mannequin that thinks she's a real person, and that's based on our local department store here in Binghamton as well. So he seemed to do a lot with mannequins, and uh, I've never heard him speak on that topic. But again, you know, he immortalized a lot of experiences that he had. Uh, you know, he never talked much about UFOs or aliens, although he wrote 18 episodes on time travel with Twilight Zone and 14 on space travel. But he did narrate the first in search of ancient astronauts. He narrated two of them on UFOs, We Are Not Alone, and one other one. Uh, he narrated another project called Encounters with the Unknown. And he was to be the regular narrator for the whole In Search of series, but then he passed away suddenly, and All they right. brought Leonard Nimoy in to do that series. My goodness. Wow. That, it, I've got another question here in the okay. chat room. I was asking... Uh, I, I know one of the people that the, this this is, this applies to. Were there any famous people who got their start on Twilight Zone, and who? I, I know William Shatner was was that one of his first major. Okay, a lot of people have said, well, Shatner did his first Twilight Zone, and that was his first acting. No, it uh, wasn't his first though. No, in 1956 yeah. or eight, he did a Playhouse 90, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, town has turned to dust. And that was one that was based on that Emmett Till case I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. So Shatner did get a start with Serling work. On Twilight Zone, and I had the privilege of interviewing a lot of them, uh, Leonard Nimoy. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not do a Twilight Zone, but he did do a night gallery. Uh -huh. uh, DeForest Kelly, Doc, is in a Twilight Zone. 
Doc? Scotty, yep, Scotty <laughs> James Doohan has a bit part in the Twilight Zone. And he built Takei, Star Trek, and people don't know it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Gene Roddenberry <laughs> was the first sci-fi writer to get his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And while he was making his speech, the first thing he said was, I feel guilty accepting this. The first star should be going to Rod Serling. Wow. He said without Rod Serling, there would be no Star Trek or right. any of these other popular sci-fi series. So we're glad he acknowledged it. Yeah. Um, George Takei, I was just mentioning, did one of the most famous episodes, but it's infamous at the same time. It's called The Encounter. It aired once, and it was about a Japanese soldier facing the American soldier in his apartment where he was renting from, and they end up killing each other. That episode aired once, and it was banned from television. They said it would never be seen again. And if Rod Serling had not had his own 16-millimeter print of that, it probably never would be. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had it for the archive and the foundation for 30 years uh, from his own personal print. But then finally CBS did release it in the DVD box set about eight or ten years ago. And it's a classic. So I was privileged. What I was doing back in 86 to 90 is I was attending the major Star Trek shows in Syracuse, Scranton, and Wilkes-Barre. And I would put on a 90-minute Rod Serling program on the history of Rod Serling. And then I would interview the guest that was there, so uh, Nimoy and George Sakay and uh, Doc and Scotty, I was able to interview them and talk about their, their serling experiences. Goodness gracious. Okay, so I just got a little jealous. I, I'm just going to admit to it. Um, <laughs> geez. I mean, you know, you, you're living a collector's dream. I mean, people collect things, and they're just like, oh, I really enjoy this. This is so much fun. But then to be able to take over the collection and be the presenter and and keeper essentially you're the keeper of this man's legacy i mean what an honor i mean you must be tickled pink every single day <laughs> yeah i am because we we launched our website the rod serling archive website so it's rod serling uh december of 2013 and we have over a thousand items up there pictured but what makes our website stand out is we have rare videos of things that nobody else has. Uh, we have videos of Helen Foley, his teacher, uh, speaking with me at the Star Trek shows and the dedication nice. of the marker and things that no one else has. And so we've had some friction with the Serling estate. Uh, so we, we're not allowed to sell anything Serling. Everything mm -hmm. we do, Rod Serling, at the Bunny Museum is free and it has been the whole oh, time. That's years. cool. Oh, we've got to get to our next break. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to me, Heidi Hollis, The Outlander, where we're always having a good time because, my goodness, we're talking about Rod Serling. Yes, yes, the Rod Serling with Michael Pfeiffer, who is the curator of the Rod Serling. Uh, museum, what is it? Is it an archive? It's a museum? Well, it's the Bundy Museum of History and Art, but ours okay. is called the Rod Serling Archive Exhibit, which is a permanent exhibit that we are rotating at least 50% of the exhibit every six months. Cool. And now the website again is what? Uh, our website is rodserlingarchive.org. Mm-hmm. Sure. And we oh. also just set up an email a month ago, rodserlingarchive at gmail.com, so that people can call in with questions, ask to be put on a Rod Serling mailing list so we can notify them of all events. And for some reason, people like to say Rod Sterling. It's without a T, everybody. <laughs> uh, that, that is so funny because I even have a movie poster of a movie Rod wrote in Universal Studios for Rod Sterling. No! Yeah, to <laughs> oh. be safe and it, So even the studio that made it spelled it wrong. Oh, my gosh. That's just... I, I cannot even imagine. That's just that's just so wrong on so many levels. So, anyways, getting back to the conversation, my gosh, Rod Sterling was somebody who really, really kind of wore his his heart on his sleeve. And you were telling me during the break that he was somebody who was severely traumatized by some of the things that he experienced uh, as a war veteran as well that m may have shaped his life a, quite a bit. Oh, it definitely shaped his, his life completely. Uh, you know, he was only 18. He, he Being born on Christmas Day uh, of 24, he graduated mm. January 13th of 43 and enlisted at 8 o'clock in the morning the next day. And he and five of his buddies from high school had been watching paratrooper films 
in the movie theaters and the newsreels, and he decided they they all decided to be paratroopers. But his goal, of course, was being Jewish to go to Europe and fight against the Nazis. Right. Fortunately, he ended up being shipped out to the Philippines and Guam, mm. and uh, so. But he was so severely traumatized seeing uh, the, in his his one division, the 511th Airborne Division, there was a smaller subdivision. And there was 185 soldiers in that, and out of the 185, 11 survived. Oh. That's how horrible that experience was. And some of the interviews we've read said Rod was placed in that because he was too cocky. He would not clean his rifle. He would go off wandering, and they'd have to send people out to, in danger to find him. So they put him in this special <laughs> hardtack division to uh, you know, go out into the jungles and, and fight one-on-one -on -one with the Japanese. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Who would ever think that <laughs> that's why he had it so rough? Oh, my gosh. I, I, I mean, it's like when it comes to war things, I mean, I, I love being naive about it because it's also awful. But, okay, so he, he experienced this trauma. Uh, he lost a lot of friends. And he comes home, and what, is he, what does he do? I mean, how does he get involved so well into the writing world? Well, he was wounded twice with a lot of shrapnel to the knees, uh, his one wrist, and his eye, one of his eyes. So he spent about a month in Manila recuperating, so he took up writing for something to do. And then when he came out, of course, his teacher, Helen Foley, in high school, he got him into public speaking, which he was so wonderful, you know his voice. Yes. And acting in plays, and he was not a good writer, she said. <laughs> so I found that interesting. But because of the war experiences, that's what he took up. So when he was discharged in 46, he went under the GI Bill to Antioch College in Ohio, uh, Yellow Springs, where his older brother Robert, seven years older, had also gone. And that's where he started writing for radio. It was just jingles and commercials, and he hated it. He wanted to write serious drama. And uh, so around 1949-50, he did start to write for television. And he sold his first two scripts to television in 1950. And uh, so it just took off from there. Between 1950 and 1960, he wrote over 200 uh, scripts and teleplays. Well, it's like he became obsessed with it. I, I understand. It's like when you realize you can create something from nothing, it's, it's yeah. addictive. I mean, it can be well, addictive. It, it is. And also, the first 40 scripts he submitted were all rejected. He had 40 rejection slips in a row before wow. he finally got something sold. So, wow. it's there's well, a, how did he support himself? I mean, you just there's so many starving artists in the world. That's just like what? Well, he was he was in college at the time under the GI Bill. He met his wife Carol Craver there, and they were married in '49. And uh, so he was working for the radio, writing for some radio there. a matter of fact, one of his first jobs when he went to Antioch in 46, they shipped him to New York City for three months as an apprentice at WNYC, where he was writing for radio in, in New York City, and something that I didn't realize till a year ago, he was acting in radio plays. And we were lucky enough to get four of these. And what they were is they were juvenile delinquents. One, he played a kid who stole a bicycle. <laughs> another one, he stole a, a, a radio. And so you would have him playing himself as that young character. And you got to keep in mind, he was only uh, 22, and he was playing like 14, 15-year-old. And then the next 20 minutes would be the judicial, the judicial part of that show, uh, how they sentenced the kid and what they did with him to rehabilitate him. <laughs> um, so he also... The first thing he wrote himself that was aired at WNYC was a tribute for Memorial Day, and it was a beautiful speech. Wow. Uh, we don't have an audio of it, but we do have a transcript of it. So he started yeah. writing for radio, and then that branched into television around 1950. And, well, he didn't give up either. I mean, it's, it's not like, oh. oh, he threw out a couple of scripts, 40 rejections. I mean, that man earned his way. I mean, he really did. Yeah. He and pushed his those, way to the top. A lot of those later, after his first Emmy with Patterns in 1955, and the second one for Requiem for Heavyweight in 1956, a lot of those earlier scripts were then recycled and sold to television programs. Gotcha. Well, and I got another question here from the chat room. Carol's asking okay. if there's a particular war-themed episode that you feel is a reflection of any of Rod's experiences. Yes, there are two. Okay. Twilight Zone, The Purple Testament... Rod Serling immortalized five of his buddies, including the first one, Melvin 
P. Levy that was uh, beheaded with the food drops. Uh, they were all, he immortalized them all with those names in that episode, The Purple Testament. And that episode dealt with uh, Dick York and Bewitched as a sergeant, and this soldier under him would look at people, and their face would glow, and he'd know they're going to die within the next day. And oh, yeah. So he mentions all of these friends of his, five of them, in one sentence, blah, blah, blah. They asked who was killed, and he goes, you know, Hibbard, Morton, something, Sloan, and Levy. And, and he did that in other episodes. Uh, another episode that was based on his experiences in the Philippines was the uh, equality of mercy with Dean Stockwell, and uh, that that episode also had Leonard Nimoy. And right now we're negotiating for one of the helmets uh, from that episode from the, the uh, Twilight Zone set designer himself, mm. and uh, we hope to have that very soon. And so those were based. Uh, you know, the sets were amazing for those. Rod was on the set. We have some pictures in the background holding the rifles and the helmets and yeah. everything that he experienced. He was right there on set for those to make sure they represented what he wanted represented. Interesting. Now, Rod, my goodness, you know, he died quite young and very tragically, almost an episode of The Twilight Zone himself. I mean, what do you think of some of the strangeness that surrounded his death? Well, it was interesting. He had gone in, he had had the two massive heart attacks uh, about three weeks earlier, and he was taken to from Ithaca area to Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester. On the way, being a five-pack-a-day smoker, he was able to convince the, the emergency crew to stop and get out and let him get out and smoke. Five-pack-a-day? Did he sleep? He was a he was a <laughs> and he was also a coffee alcoholic and a heavy drinker. So he, he said he spent on Twilight Zone those years, seven days a week, 16 hours a day for the five years on Twilight Zone. Oh. That was his work schedule. So as he was wheeled down on the gurney into open heart surgery for bypass surgery, uh, I spoke to one of the nurses back in 86 that wheeled him down on the gurney into the OR. I called the hospital, found out who, and talked to her. And she said they let him have a cigarette five minutes before they wheeled him into the OR. <laughs> And then 10 hours later, during surgery, he had a massive third heart attack, which took his life. But Gosh. what happened when he died, it was 2-something, I believe, in the afternoon, 2.15. Was it on the table, operating table he died? On the operating table, yes, that third okay. massive one during surgery. Mm. And we've spoken with some of the other staff at the hospital, and they said that a dark cloud came down and enveloped the entire hospital for hours Whoa. right when Rob died. Oh, and this is in Rochester at Strong Memorial, and uh, just could it have uh, happened any other way? I mean, honestly, we're speaking of Rod Sterling. <laughs> he, he went out in style, if we if she we want to call it that. I mean, he was too young, fifty years old. It was like he blew know. a smoke ring around the hospital. That's awesome. Yeah, almost. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but uh, you know, it, it was interesting to be able to call back then because it was only eleven years after he had passed, and a lot of that staff was still there. And they were willing to talk about it. <laughs> Excuse me. That is absolutely amazing. So, now, do you know of anything that had ever happened in his life that may have inspired some of the more paranormal elements? I mean, all the alien topics, all of the spooky topics, psychic topics. Did he ever share that he had experienced something odd? Not in any of the interviews that I've read, and I've read hundreds of them in different magazines. Uh, there's also some 90-minute interviews, some speeches he did at UCLA that are part of the DVD box set. And he never really talked about any experiences along those lines. But as I was sharing with you earlier, I believe that he said that you know he went that route to be able to express like he did in live television without censorship, where aliens could say something that you know a congressman or a, any politician or whatever could not say and get away with it at the time. So that's why he went into the science fiction fantasy room. Does he feel that people got that message, you know, that what he was really talking about behind oh, all I these aliens? I think they definitely did because, like, you know, you and I both shared, people yeah. watch these over and over and over, and yeah. they hear one line and they know the episode. And, and yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, he, he died not having the recognition that he really wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. He was asked a question in 74, a year before he passed, what do you want to be remembered as? And he said, if 100 years from now they say, oh, he was a writer, 
that's good enough for me. So he never, the, the, the claim and the legacy came years after his death because Night Gallery, he had no control over it. They hired him strictly for his name, Rob Serling's Night Gallery. Hmm. He had no control. As a matter of fact, Jack Laird, the producer, uh, by the middle of the second season, would not even read any more of Rod's scripts, didn't want anything to do with him. Uh, so it was a, a sore point in Rod's life. So when it ended after three seasons, Rod was not devastated. Wow. But, My uh, goodness. <clears throat> The other thing he wanted to be was a major motion picture writer, and that never happened. He never really hit the home run, other than with Planet of the Apes. And we need to talk briefly on that, because most yeah. of the listeners, with the new one that came out six months ago, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and all of this chain continuing, are right. not aware that Rod Serling wrote the original script. What happened was, on the box set for Planet of the Apes from 68, Roddy McDowell, who played Cornelius the lead ape, does a 90-minute documentary on the history of the movie. And Rod Serling wrote over two years, 30, 30 different drafts of the script for Planet of the Apes, all of which were rejected, mostly because of the expense involved. They only had like a million two budget. So he Did you say 33? 33. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, yeah. Oh, 30. And, oh, uh, gosh. So, it's amazing. So we were lucky and just got a copy of his second draft. And there's been a lot of controversy over the ending with the Statue of Liberty and realizing I'm here on Earth all along. And a lot of people said Rod didn't write that well. Of course he did, and we can prove it now with his second script. And the final script, they hired him back after a year to co-write it. And that's what we have for the movie. He was co-writer on the original movie as it exists today. And that is considered by some of the big movie critics of the New York Times and different papers as the most iconic, best twist ending in the history of motion pictures. My God, you know, it's, it leaves a lot for the imagination of what may come in the future. So are you saying that he came up with the whole concept of it, or did he borrow, no, they, was he told was what to book. write? It was, or, a, it was book. a book. Okay, yeah, yeah I didn't know. France, I think his name was Bull, yeah. Bull, B-O-U-L-E, something like that. Gotcha. I was and, trying to uh, think. I'm like, I thought that one was based on a, on a book series. Yeah, okay. So he, he was adapted. As a matter of fact, the guy that wrote the book did not even want it made into a movie. Mm. But they offered him enough money that he, he went with it. But it was just hard to bring to the screen. As a matter of fact, some of the characters in Planet of the Apes are also names of his war buddies that were killed. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, he did that in a lot interesting. of things. Interesting. You know, if you remember Alfred Hitchcock, every movie he did, he puts himself in for like 10 seconds in a short, real quick yes. cameo. And well, this is what Rod did, not putting himself in, but putting all of his family, friends, his wife Carol's in several by name, his daughters Anne and Jody. Uh, his doctor, Jack Levine, his best friend, is in the night gallery. Uh, the McNulty sister, you know, he immortalized a lot of his friends in, in his writings. So his, he had he had kids. So where are they and what are they up to? Are they involved in any way with his work right now? Anne Serling, the youngest daughter, wrote a tremendous book. She's a writer. Uh, two years ago, she would she would have to be. I mean, that's in her blood. Yeah, she's a great <laughs> writer. And the book is called My Dad as I Knew Him, Rod Serling. So she's been doing a major book tour for two years. I've read it twice. I've listened to the audio book twice, and I love it. Although I have documents to you know disprove some of the things in there, but. It, it's a great book. It really is. So she's very active. As a matter of fact, she's scheduled to come to the Bundy Museum uh, September 19th of this year for some um, our radio broadcasters Hall of Fame, which is part of the museum. And, of course, Rod's in that. And when she was invited by some third party, she says, well, I'll come, but I've had differences with those people. <laughs> so it's not a great relationship. But what we're doing is we've approached the lawyers for the estate Certainly in the state, and we're going to, you know, buy licensings so that mm -hmm. we can, if we want to make some products or do a book or whatever, then we'll legally be able to do that because we don't want any friction. All, All we're right. trying to do is keep Rod Serling's legacy alive. All and right. I'll tell you, you, you're a big part in helping. Uh, you know, some of these radio shows that have been calling for me is is keeping his legacy alive in a big way because you have such massive listening bases. Yeah. So it, you know, it's a wonderful thing that. Because of the archive exhibit and uh, the newspaper articles nationwide and worldwide, we're now really getting a lot of fame, and people realize that we're doing wonderful things. They said we've got nothing more but to keep his legacy alive. Right, right. I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I don't know many people who did not enjoy his work. I mean, he and, and recognize him. 
and know that voice and know his little his little stance and the the way that he presented his topics. I mean, it. I mean, they've got a ride that's called the Twilight Zone down at down in Florida. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, I mean it is, and it's him appearing, and it's like, oh, it's Rod, and then they drop you, you know, and you scream. I couldn't and... do it because of the wheelchair, <laughs> but my sister did ride it. Yeah, and she, you know, I've seen video. Some of you has videotaped it and has it on YouTube, where you see the hologram of Rod talking. Yes. And, the voice characters and things. So, and it's like he's know, right it's, there. It's a wonderful ride. And, uh, you know, so right now in the works is a new Twilight Zone movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. It's been in the really? works for three years. And unlike the first movie, which was four episodes, this will be one episode, time travel based, going back 80 years in time. Uh, that's been in the works for a few years now. You mm. can read a uh, Google search on that, and I'm not sure when the last update was. Also, something he wrote, the last thing in his typewriter stops along the way, is being produced as a five-part miniseries by J.J. Abrams. Nice. So that's supposed to be in the work right now. Then we're told Carol Serling's doing a biopic movie of Rod Serling. Uh, so there's so much in the works. And a matter of fact, I went to Internet Movie Database for Rod Serling last week, mm-hmm. and there's something up there that puzzles me. It says, 2015, The Hitchhiker, new series by Rod Serling. <laughs> well, one of the famous episodes was The Hitchhiker. So I don't know if they base the whole series on that one episode, mm. but he's listed as the writer, and here it's 2015. He's still working on the other yeah, side. He's not getting any residuals. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, it's like I don't see why somebody couldn't, like, totally make him, like, a, a, a superhero character and The Adventures of Rod Serling, and had he... You know, maybe he came from another planet, you know, and, like, write it into the script and, and like, make him be this really ge- – I mean, because he is genius. I'm sorry. He is mm-hmm. genius. And it's, like, to see where he truly was born and kind of explore that and take him into the future beyond his 50 years when he passed and, you know, and see where, where he takes us because I, I think – He's just so – he's got so many levels that weren't explored, and I really wish that, you know, more was, was shown about him and his life because I think a lot of people share the same sentiment that I do, that he is – he really has captured my imagination growing up. He got me excited about the whole 30 minutes and everything that he could pack into those 30 minutes, and mm-hmm. I mean – it's it's like I mean he he did magic the man was magical and I mean there's just so much more that I really I would want to know more about him because he was just that cool he was just that interesting so I, if there was one thing that you wanted to put out there we only have a few minutes left that you want people to know or that you didn't think that you know you don't think a lot of people know about I mean what would you what would you share? Well, Helen Foley's teacher had a quote that she would use when she did a news clip or anything, and she was very emphatic, a great speaker, and she said, Rod Serling's voice will never be stilled, not ever, never. And she would point right in your face. Uh-huh. And that's what we're, and we agree with it. That's what we're trying to do is keep his voice alive uh, through his writing. And like you just mentioned a minute ago, people know who Rod Serling, they can yes. see a picture and know him. Yes. Name, name another famous writer from the 50s and 60s and 70s huh. that you know what they look like. No. You can't. No. Because of his intros and exits on Twilight Zone. In the first year, you know, he did not do that. He did the narratives only. It wasn't until mm-hmm. the second year he decided he was going to take over and be on screen presence uh, for both the front, middle, and end of those. Oh, gosh. You know, it, it was genius, him even doing that and letting us know who he was and, and allowing us to associate his work with his face, his voice, and everything that he did because he took us there. It was like, oh, here comes Rod. Rod's going to take me by the hand, and we're going to explore another world now. Oh, thank you, Rod. That was so cool. Oh, my gosh, my brain is blown. My brain is blown. Even though I can't, you know, I would never associate it with, you know, some of the political stuff and and the message that he was directly trying to get across. But he always got you to think. And so there was a message that got across no matter what. You know, it got you to think beyond what we think reality is. So you are in the Twilight Zone. America has always been in the Twilight Zone. I don't know if people knew that. But, um... And and it's a saying. Oh gosh, that girl's in the Twilight Zone. Oh, oh here comes a Twilight Zone episode. You know. Oh, yeah. my life is a Twilight Zone. You know, we associate is the Twilight Zone and his work and his voice and everything with so many things still. And I don't think it's going to end. I really don't. 
No, I don't see it ending either. Uh, you know, I talked to some people today, the young college students, and they're not too familiar with the old black and whites, but they watch the new, the 1985-9 series and the 92 series. And about 10 of those were redone, re uh, doings of Rod's original scripts. It's a Good Life and uh, The After Hours, and a lot of those they redid in these later series. So I started watching a few of the color ones, and some are quite interesting. But yeah. if they weren't the ones that he actually wrote in the beginning, you can you can see the difference. Even if you look at the original series and you see one, you know three minutes in, Rod did not write this one. You know, <laughs> as, good, as good as they are. Yeah. He did not write it. You, Wh- you know. Which was his favorite? What was his very favorite epi- episode that he personally... The pers- episodes that he wrote for Twilight Zone, it was the uh, Nazi Dachau prison camp episode, Death's Head Revisited. And he was so adamant when he was asked his favorite episode, he said, not only is it my favorite episode of Twilight Zone, but he says, it's the best work I ever wrote. Death's Bed Revisited. Death's Head, H-E-A-D. Oh, Oh, Death Head. Okay. Yes, and it's it's where you go back to Dachau, and the the man that was torturing everybody is confronted by Joseph Schilkraut, who was one that he had murdered, and his ghost is there, and they drive him crazy and torture him in Dachau, just like he did everybody. And Goodness. Rod said he feels that's the best thing he ever wrote. Awesome. Well, I've got to definitely see that one again. Well, you know what? We've already come to the bottom of our show, and the website again is rodserling.org. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, well, thank you, Michael Pfeiffer. I mean, my goodness, you've really, really just wowed me. This has been a really, really great uh, show, show talking to you, a great hour. I mean, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having us. And, and uh, again, if they want to email me, rodserlingarchive at gmail.com. We'll put them on the mailing list, update them of everything we're doing Rod Serling related to the archive. And go to the many events that you guys are hosting there constantly throughout the year, all for free. You guys, you've been listening to me, Heidi Hollis, The Outlander. Remembering always if it's weird, we're here. Good night, everybody. <laughs>